majestic, breathtaking, vital, vulnerable. North America's most valuable resource is at risk. The Great Lakes, although beautiful, are a fragile freshwater ecosystem that needs to be protected. Our mission, saving the Great Lakes. Climate change and extreme weather becoming more frequent. Severe storms bringing our region torrential rain and widespread flooding. High lake levels and erosion causing millions of dollars of damage to our prized shoreline. Pollution causing toxic algal blooms from fertilizer runoff and an abundance of plastic being left on our shores and in the water. Invasive species wreaking havoc on the natural ecosystem. North Avenue Beach, one of the many beautiful sandy beaches along Lake Michigan's shoreline. Chicago as its stunning backdrop. Surrounding cities wouldn't be what they are today without the Great Lakes. So how do we save this fragile ecosystem? Many factors at play, but one common goal. So many working to protect and preserve these glorious bodies of water and our cities we call home. This ecosystem is huge. It's just enormous, you know, hundreds of thousands of square miles from New York, from the St. Lawrence Seaway, all the way to Duluth, Minnesota. You know, that's halfway across the country. To manage it, you need partnerships. You need people who, who understand their local areas, who understand the larger ecosystem, but who are willing to work together um, at all levels. The Great Lakes are about 20% of the world's fresh surface water and we have it right here in the backyard of the Upper Midwest. So it's an incredible resource. The main challenge is to make sure it stays clean, that it stays available to everybody who lives here, and that we protect it from threats like uh, invasive species and agricultural pollution. We observe the beauty walking along Chicago's shoreline. Joel Brahmeyer, president and CEO of the Alliance for the Great Lakes, tells us there's a large front backing the protection of our lakes and tackling its biggest threats in hopes of achieving long-term goals. One of the great things about this region is that it came together about 10 years ago and uh, started to build a program called the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. And this is a major investment of federal, state, and local money into the Great Lakes that has brought billions of dollars to bear on restoring and protecting this great water uh, over the last decade. Roughly $300 million a year has been dedicated to this action plan with main goals of focusing on highly contaminated areas. We are essentially the decision maker at the end of the day, but we want to do that with a lot of input. The other thing we have to do is we have to make sure that our expenditures um, of a lot of taxpayer money, um, we want to make sure that we follow our action plan because that five-year action plan, that is our blueprint for what we hope to do. Top priority, a continuing problem across the Midwest caused by fertilizer runoff from farming contaminating the Great Lakes. Weaving our way through the wetlands of northern Indiana, Professor Jennifer Tank explains one solution already in the works to offset this problem, planting cover crops. What cover crops are is uh, you simply plant something like a rye grass uh, and it looks almost like a lawn, ryegrass on your fields, and it creates like a blanket, a blanket of live biomass that protects the soils from the time that you would normally have bare fields, so November, say, through to April or May of the next year. And what that does is then when those storms come or spring snow melt, you've got this blanket over the fields and it keeps nutrients and the soils on the fields where farmers want them not in the adjacent waterways. Pollution prevention is not only in the hands of farmers and scientists, we can help keep the more than 22 million pounds of plastic that ends up in the Great Lakes every year out with a few small changes in our everyday lives. Imagine any place in your day-to-day -day life where you might be able to reduce the amount of waste that you produce uh, or come up with substitutions for your daily activities that might hopefully be reusable, more recyclable, more sustainable. You know, none of us are perfect. We can't do this all the time. Um, so that's important to recognize as well. If there's, any, if there's anything you can do, any substitution you can make, um, and for the times that you can make it, 
that is actually contributing to the solution. And um, you know, if no one has said thank you or no one has said I appreciate you doing that, you know, you can hear me saying it. I thank you and I appreciate you doing that. And on behalf of so many other people, all of our neighbors, all of our children, and you know, the people to come in the future. And beneath the waves, a vast ecosystem in need of protection. Just steps from Lakeshore Drive and 51st Street, an underwater hidden gem, an ancient coral reef. Tens of thousands of people are driving past it every day. Hardly anyone knows that it's there or even pays attention to it. So I think what the most important thing is that we get people to realize that Morgan Shoal is out there. There are other places like this possibly nearby that can be highlighted as well. There's a lot more going on beneath the Lake Michigan and we need to appreciate that. And this is important because Lake Michigan is our source of drinking water. Um, it's a source of fishing. It's a source of all kinds of recreation, beaches, all of these types of things. They're all interconnected and we have to figure out better solutions for a lot of these problems if we want to keep utilizing this resource in a responsible manner. Protecting an underwater oasis and creating a long-term plan to restore and sustain our shoreline will cost more than $71 million for design and construction. We're actually uh, looking into a, doing a resiliency study, a Great Lakes resiliency study, which is a, a one and a half million dollar study where we're going to actually look at the vulnerabilities of the lakefront and uh, um, Lake Michigan in general and just uh, come up with, well, what can we do and just study the situation of the long term. The lakefront is actually also a really big economic driver for the city. So if you think of all the festivals and events and concerts and the air show and things that bring in tourists to the city of Chicago, it's jobs, it's, you know, making sure that our city is healthy um, from an environmental standpoint. You know, we want to make sure this is our, our water source. Um, so all those things come into play and just make the, the lakefront and the shoreline a critical resource for all of us. This fragile ecosystem interconnects a complex food web. Invasive species are threatening and disrupting the lake's natural biodiversity. Asian carp have exploded in population downstream in the Illinois River, causing irreversible damage. The Army Corps of Engineers is dedicating millions of dollars to a new multi-phase project to keep the carp out of Lake Michigan. We're gonna use air bubbles to get them out from between the barges. We'll be having sound. Uh, as we mentioned, they, they react to mo motorboat sounds. So we're gonna use that against them. We're gonna try and drive them away with sound. And then we're also gonna use electricity again. So we think that the combination of those technologies uh, will help prevent them from getting into the lock. Another thing that we're working on is educating the public about Asian carp. We want to make sure that when people are out uh, collecting fish, when they're on the Illinois River, they don't put those fish in their boat and then somehow transport them into the Great Lakes. So there's a lot of education that's gone on. I know the Illinois Department of Natural Resources has put out a lot of information trying to educate fishermen. And already covering the bottom of Lake Michigan, invasive quagga mussels filtering out food for native fish. New techniques are being tested to remove these mussels. Zequinox is a pesticide injected under anchored tarps and results show a 95% reduction rate after applications. We need to be open to new ideas and new technology. We've discussed Zequinox with the, um, the Great Lakes Commission um, and, and the people who are working very closely on that. Now recently I just read that it may actually be a different chemical but they're looking at another potential technology that may be even more effective against um, the quagga mussels. But the short answer to your question is, we have to keep abreast of new technological advances. Um, we have to keep talking to the experts and we need to be open to those ideas. An issue harder to solve, our changing climate. Combating high lake levels and intense temperature swings will take a team of the brightest minds in the region to compose a plan of action to preserve the lakes and the cities we call home. We're seeing more rainfall, we're seeing more intense storms, uh, we're seeing just greater erosion and uh, just a lot more water running into the lakes. And that's a hard one to fix because if you, if you try to address an issue here by building a break wall, by doing something, you may just be moving the problem down somewhere else. The other thing I would point out is in 2013, 2014, which isn't that long ago, 
People were very worried because the lake level was so low. So nothing is easy. Um, we're dealing with um, a very fluid environment. It's changing all the time. And you have to do the best predictions you can using the smartest people, the expertise, the knowledge of so many people across the lakes to make the best, the best decisions about what you do. What can the general public do? And then what can governments in our country and, and our states do? And I think those are separate questions. For individuals, I think, you know, just using less energy and using less water are both important uh, adaptation and mitigation strategies. Installing um, efficient heating and cooling equipment, insulating our houses, uh, turning the thermostat down, driving less, all of these are things that we can do. Flying less actually is a very important one. This problem is going to require uh, us as a nation and as a member of the international community to work together globally to solve this problem. A problem so many remain hopeful we can solve. Passionate partnerships and passionate involvement from so many federal agencies, from the Great Lakes states, from local partners, from tribes, from organizations, from non-governmental organizations, and amazingly enough, they're working well together, and I think they all want to keep working well together, and that's why things are happening. I think betting against humanity is, uh, is not a good bet. I think we are pretty resourceful. And as many people have said, you know, as if you're sitting on the beach and the water's coming in, you're not just gonna sit there and let the water engulf you. You're gonna move back, right? You're gonna take action and, and get out of the way. And we will certainly see that too. I mean, people are not just gonna take it, they're gonna adapt. And we are very adaptable. We know how to do that. The Great Lakes are a huge source of fresh water. And so the fact that we have so much of it here means I think that we have an obligation to be good stewards of that incredible resource. We actually can make a difference. And I think by um, tackling it one piece at a time, by uh, sort of keeping together and making sure everyone's included, you know, I really do, uh, genuinely, I really do believe that these improvements are possible. Protecting a resource that is so great, so fragile. Hey, if you like that video, be sure to subscribe to our ABC7 Chicago YouTube channel.